What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and today we're looking at a very cool arrangement of one of my favorite pieces. Shostakovich's Waltz Number no. 2 for Variety Orchestra, which is a great name. What is a Variety Orchestra exactly? We've got a bass duo version available from Brent Edmondson. So today I'm going to walk through this piece, play it, you can check it out. We're going to hear from Brent about the backstory behind this arrangement and doing these bass duos, and we've got four of them in our sheet music store at present. Shostakovich Waltz Number no. 2 from his jazz suite, uh, or suite for Variety Orchestra, rather. Obviously, that's got a lot of commercial credibility. It was, you know, it, it's been in commercials, literally, but it's also been in movies, like Eyes Wide Shut is one that, that prominently uses it, although your younger viewers don't, you know, don't go looking that one up, necessarily. Um, 
but I, you know, I love, I, I love Shostakovich. I love the macabre quality to it. I love the way that it's very, um, you know, it, it's very haunting and yet it's also beautiful. Like you kind of move between unsettling and beautiful, very, very fluidly. My biggest pride moment in that piece, it, it comes when there's a recapitulation of the original theme down an octave and in, in the original orchestration of the piece, that's a trombone solo accompanied by piccolo, which how very Shostakovich uh, of him to do that. And so what I did was I, you know, by bringing the, the melody down an octave, I freed up some sonic space and the second bass, you know, I still feel a little bit dubious about this when I go to play it because it's really hard, but I conceived of this just uh, this Bottasini type accompaniment to that, that would be something along the lines of uh, one of the, you know, really arpeggiated movements of one of the variations that he had done, or the um, the grand duo has one of these great moments of, you know, the the second bass player is literally covering from the low D to the like the highest notes of the bass, uh, over and over and over again. You're just cycling through it. It's like a great technique etude, but it's also just a really fun way to watch the first bass player go into the comfort zone and be able to play and like really lay into the lyrical line but then watch the second bass player just like collapse in a heap of steam at the same time. Like, I think it's a really good juxtaposition and it's really, you know, it's a, capturing that theatrical element of, of the music itself where, you know, there's a spectacle happening. There's somebody doing something really absurd on their instrument right now. And besides the fact that the music's cool, this is something that's fun to watch. Okay. Let's dive into this recording. It's such a classic opening, such a simple <laughs> opening, that 1-5 opening. It's one of those things that I was beating myself up on because I would record it and I would realize I am late as I'm playing this. I am listening back to the metronome click and I am just late. So I, this has been a good self-education in just staying on top of the beat or in time or however you want to describe it. Okay, so key, this is an excellent key for this piece. And I have been thinking about this piece in different keys. Actually, I did an arrangement for a student for guitar and bass, and I put it uh, in, what was it? I was in G minor for the one that I was doing. This version works much better in D minor, just the where it sits on the bass. I didn't even think to do this. So it's a, it's a great area on the bass. I'm doing it mostly up and down the G string, as you can see. And it's, it's a good opportunity to practice expressive shifting. It doesn't go too crazy high, uh, like my G minor major version, but it's just a, a lot of fun in this key. All of that G sharp. A little funky pitch, Jason. Welcome to my life. And these double stops in the second part are so cool. I love how Brent's got, he's got the perfect fourth, then he's got the major second, the D and the E, and that is particularly fun to play. So that second part, all of those things sit very well, especially the very ending part. You can do it in thumb position, just kind of stay up there. Change the dynamics the second time through. Take it down a little bit if you want. Play the upper part a little bit differently. Yeah, pitch. Come on, Jason. Crescendo! Woo! It's just great as a shifting exercise, if nothing else. It's a great arrangement, but, but what a fun way to practice getting around the bass. Second parts, dance around the bass a little more. And this first part actually sits quite well in the Roboth fifth position where you have the thumb on the, uh, if you're on the G string, it would be on the D on the G string, D harmonic up in thumb position or the A harmonic on the D string. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, um, this melody sits quite well in that area. So I found myself, I was playing around with a lot of different fingerings. That fingering seemed to work quite well for this B section. <laughs> Take a little time. <laughs> you 
can land on the pitch too. Jason, come on. You can hear my foot pedal <laughs> changing. I've got this Bluetooth foot pedal for my iPad if you listen closely. You can take more time here. I'm just trying to stay with the click. By the way, that is not mugging for the camera. The big cheesy smile over my face. I, I do that all the time when I play. I don't know why. Maybe that's a bad habit, but uh, it's what I do. So I got the repeat. That's a moment that was actually pretty tricky to figure out, the bowing. This is the second ending, so this would be measure, what is that, 93. Um, uh, da hound up, down, up, down. How is, how is that coming out? I, I ended up up bow on the, on the long A when I was doing the bowing that seemed to work, which works, uh, but it always felt a little bit. Uh, anyway, I'll probably play around with that more when I actually do this in public. Back to the top. Cheesy grin. And you could do it even differently a third time if you want. Maybe louder this time, more vibrato, softer, whatever. And one thing I could be doing more of, I'm kind of thinking that I'm going to critique, I'm not really critiquing myself much in this one besides pitch. Um, one thing that I would like to do more in terms of this piece is, is you know, it's it's this 3-4 this, uh, feel um, by, by the bar, thinking more of super phrase or longer phrases, like phrases made up of a few bars, like ya da da da, making a crescendo through a few bars, making a day crescendo. I'm I'm kind of playing a little bit too much bar by bar, which is a pretty standard thing to do. It's something that I I tell people when I'm doing clinics or when I'm working with students. So uh, I need to work on that and just kind of make bigger phrases. This is a perfect piece for working on that, by the way. Also, I guess if I'll continue the critique here, um, I, in these bigger shifts, I have this sort of like warbly vibrato. I kind of sound like a like a ninety year old choir member um, getting up to that high note. So uh, just working to synchronize. I don't know what I need to do. I need to do something though because it, it just sound, everything feels just a little out of whack for those. But that's something I will work on as I keep working on this piece. <laughs> I ended up playing the separate bows off the string for these eighth notes. That seemed to work well. And I guess the quarters, too. It's really fun. Okay, now, before we start this right here, this is probably the most, <laughs> not probably, this is definitely the most challenging part of this piece. The first part does the melody now down the octave. So you're on the A string and D string. And and the second part has these beastly eighth notes that Brent <laughs> was talking about. And and I, I spent many a moment trying to work them up. And I was playing them a little more on the string when I was actually practicing. And what happens to me when it's actually time to play, even if it's just for the camera and microphone like it is here, is I freak out and I end up playing them really short. So my eighth notes, I'm just I'm, I'm preparing you for this. My eighth notes are shorter than I would like, and it's kind of hard to hear the pitches. At the very least, I would try to lengthen the downbeats, and I would try to get a little more pitch out of the bass in general. It kind of sounds like I'm just sort of like plucking dead strings, uh, my opinion. It's a really cool, it's really cool writing. The challenge, though, is to get that melody to come out when it's down the octave, and to get the second part uh, audible in terms of pitch, but also light enough that it doesn't uh, cover up the top part, or the, the first part. <laughs> Tension in my face. <laughs> I'm playing those eighth notes. Two real different kinds of focus needed here. <laughs> That's a fun part to play, though. Got these great chords to close it out. I hit the side of the bass there. Kind of works though. 
Ole! Haha! Oh, I love that. It's such a cool arrangement. All right, that's a look at one of my favorite pieces. Thank you, Brent, for putting this together. We've got links in the description below for you to check it out. And if you're interested in more double bass sheet music, check out this very cool video we've got linked here. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next video.